So, this is John Reed to Dynamica Success Connect 2023. You guys probably remember the old days when I would get a troublemaker to sit down for an old school podcast. Well, those days are back, Chris. Hey, <laughs> what up? Hey, John. Uh, good to be here with you. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, a quick shout out to Jared Pazahonic, the original troublemaker, who was all originally my guest in, in these podcasts. And we used to yeah, make some memorable podcasts. Jared's retired, if y'all probably know that, hanging out with his family, kudos. But now we got to press on, Chris, because there's still questions we got to get answered. So Th There are. And I'm known for asking those questions. Yes, indeed. But in a nice way. Right. And that's that's one reason why I asked Chris to be here is because Chris is, in my view, the kind of partner that you want in this community, which is a partner. I think of you as a customer advocate. I hope that doesn't bother you to describe you that way. Absolutely would. Yeah. But it bothers me a little bit when I see too many partners uh, where I feel like the competition is who can be nicest to the vendor and 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 be you know give the most praise to the vendor and it's like well that doesn't help the customer. Yes, John, I, and I think that uh, actually being part of the customer community as well is a, a huge important thing. It's something that not necessarily all partners and, and certainly not all consultants um, are doing, which yeah. surprises me. Um, because there you actually have the opportunity to understand what the problems are for right. customers and, and help them out as well. I right. mean, it, it, is, it is actually a good thing. I do certainly see that there is, for success factors, there is a partner community as well, right. which is kind of gated from the rest of the customers. And you actually see partners helping partners, which is a whip, bit weird, right. you know, because we're in competition with each other. But in the end, I think those those people who are part of that community uh, get the point that we're trying to actually deliver right. a service to customers, yeah? Right. Um, uh, which was one of the things which was mentioned at the beginning of um, the Partner Connect, which is the, the day one of the Success Connect uh, you know, conference. Well, it, it was mentioned that, you know, we should be serving rather than selling. And, yep. and that's, that's something that it was a bit weird to me to actually hear someone say that because I was like, you should, surely you should be doing this already. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, look, perhaps we've got a little way to evolve on that journey. Um, and by shouting out and trying to get the best deal for the partners, sorry, for the, not for the partners, for the customers, I should say, I think is actually beneficial to the partners as well. Yeah. Like we, we, we benefit from having good customer stories. Yeah, and this is one of the big positive changes in our industry, though it's by no means complete, but there's, you know, I believe this whole notion of customer success, it does need to be redefined in, in the customer's interest, but this notion behind it is, is very welcome to me, which is like now we can kind of be held accountable to metrics around how we're delivering for customers. Yeah. And in, in past eons of the on-prem ERP world, it wasn't like that. You would just sell stuff and sell more stuff. That's right. And sell more stuff, and then you would sell more. And That's you never really looked at like, you know, how are we actually serving, in, in your definition, the customer's interest. And so let's take that forward, and you know, hopefully these kinds of conversations, in my view, are, are part of that. Um, now, just for the listeners, we are at the end of the first formal day of the conference. Uh, so Chris had a bunch of burning questions he wanted to get answered. So we're gonna find out in a sec how much progress he made on day, day one. But before we do that, I feel like, you know, since since you and I have gone way back in, in our dialogue here, w w can you just give a few thoughts on how you've seen all of this change and evolve over the time that you've been involved in this community? Oh my goodness, that's been quite a long time. Yeah. You know, Cause you know, I've been doing SAP HR for yeah. 25 years. Yeah, let's just do the success so. factors Let's just do part. the success factors yeah. bit. That's been, yeah. um, like, product has evolved immensely, even with the beginning of Employee Central coming in and actually forming a system of record. Yeah. And, and that is now the core part. You know, SAP often say, start anywhere, go anywhere. Yeah. Don't start it. Start with EC. Yeah. <laughs> and then go from there. Use, that, use your core. Um, system of record and and move onwards, but um, recently, you know, over the past few years, there was the Qualtrics purchase and then HXM, and there was a lot of talk then. You know, well, you know, is that just jumping on the X bandwagon mm. with Qualtrics and the experience? 
And what we've seen is that definitely wasn't. You know, Qualtrics is still around, it's there. Um, it gets implemented from time to time, but the focus on actually trying to improve employee experience, mm. particularly, um, yes, improving the experience of the HR teams who are using the solution as well on a day-to-day -day basis and the managers, but particularly making a focus on the employee themselves and mm. empowering the employee to actually make some decisions and choices about their own career and how they feel and how they fit into the organization. And by doing that, you know, giving the employees some idea that it's worthwhile for them to give up information about themselves, about what they want to do, where they want to go, which in turn helps the organization figure out, you know, where best can I put this employee in my company? Mm. So that, that transformation from being sort of a, I think, you know, an HR led to a, manager-led to an employee-led engagement is mm. something that I've really seen coming through in the last 10 years. And so it's, it's not there yet. It's not mm. fully there, uh, uh, totally. Yeah? There's still a whole bunch of things and different organizations will be in different stages of that evolution. Right. But the product is starting to enable some of that functionality. Yeah, I think that's interesting too because this is a theme overall in, in enterprise software and cloud software especially is this, the software has room for improvement but it's getting good enough that I think it puts the pressure back on the customer in a way on their processes and how they treat people because the software can enable employee well-being and employee success but I now the customer look, has look, I think, to and do I that. think the, the thing there is now the customer's got to try and understand. There's one of the things I wanted to try and pick up whilst at this conference, I don't think I've got there yet, is understanding where's the clear return on investment right. in actually enabling that employee experience. Yeah? Right. Because there's, there's a whole bunch that you can do. But how do we know as, you know, how, right. does a, how does a customer know that putting that effort and that subscription cost into mm. enabling some of this stuff is going to actually, at the other end of the day, increase their productivity, increase their retention? Uh, it, where's, where's the benefit there? Because you don't, you know. Right. You know, we're not altruistic. We're trying to, you know, we're, we're trying, yeah. we're trying to, you know, companies are trying to make money. They're trying to do the right thing by their employees, right. but they're not going to do something just, you know, completely out there and pay lots of money to a software company like SAP to implement something that isn't actually then going to give them some return. And and that's the bit that I think is, I'm still struggling to find some very clear yeah. um, points. Like when, as AI comes more into the conversation as well, mm. that's another clear space where like it probably is going to make a huge amount of savings and stuff, but, but where is that at return on investment? Well, and what's interesting about what you just said is that, I, you know, you can certainly set up metrics to, to measure things like attrition rates and re retention of, of top talent and things like that. But I have this adamant belief that happier customers lead to a better customer experience, but that belief is not the same as being able to show that on a balance sheet, right? That's it. And and so in my company, we can just go with it because we're a small yep. upstart media operation. But a big corporate <laughs> company can't no, make decisions. You, you've got to make it, you've got to have a justification. There's got right. to be a paper that goes to the board that says, yeah. this is what we're expecting to get out of yeah. this, putting this solution in. Well, if you can find that, there's going to be handshakes and smiles for you. So <laughs> hopefully you can find that because I think it's really important to, to get the proof points that show that yeah. because right now I think too often employees are still a neglected part of this equation. And, and it's interesting because I had a really good talk today with a Starbucks uh, HR leader who had presented a session with a couple other customers. And I asked him afterwards about this because I said, like, your employees are amazing. Like, I sit there sometimes and watch in awe, like, how fast they can move and how much stuff they do. And I'm like, but what else can we do for them? Like, because it seems to me that ultimately this technology needs to serve 
those types of people. And yeah. it's not easy to do because consumers are walking into the store with this award-winning digital application from Starbucks. Yeah. And they expect all kinds of stuff. They yeah. want their coffee, they want it now, they have all these flavors they want. And the employee, I think, is handicapped in that scenario, if, if that word isn't too provocative. And, and so it was really interesting to hear from them about how they're trying to change that, interestingly enough, by one of the things they've done is they built a, a, an app via BTP, a, mm -hmm. a benefits app that they're presenting on tomorrow, but it has to do with giving employees more access to the information they need to get the benefits that they need to do their jobs better. But Which, I think this kind of ties into this whole discussion that you're Yeah, it, right I mean, I think that is the core principle of HXM, yeah. which is, you know, the, the vision that we've been trying to live through and, and build out. But I, what I want to be able to see is like, okay, this particular component, you know, where, where's, where's, where's the value proposition? Right. And that's, that's I, I think it's, it's great. A lot of us see that these are amazing things. Like, right. you know, I was talking about AI and, you know, one of the things I was looking for is, you know, I knew that I was going to hear a lot about AI at this conference. Of course. You know, it's like, as Meg Bear tweeted back to me, like, that's a given now, Chris. It's not even a drinking game. You know, yeah, it's, exactly. it's going to be there. But um, I actually saw something that wowed me. Um, and it was uh, a generative AI um, developing a performance goal. And so I looked at just you typed in a performance goal. I said, okay, because of the work I do, um, create an SAP BTP success factors extension. So put that as the goal. And bang, it prompted out a like a year long plan with milestones of what I need to do in order to do that. And, mm. you know, even to the point of like getting it on the SAP store at the end, it was pretty, okay, yeah, it was SAP tech, so hopefully I've been trained on some information that had done that, but that was pretty amazing. Yep. Now I've got to figure out is, you know, how to use that so that I don't end up paying a huge subscription cost on generative AI because all my employees are going to try and generate 50 goals because the tooling is so cool. Right. I don't want 50 goals, please. Like as a manager, I have to review people's performance forms. Like I want as few as possible. Right. I want them to be relevant. And, and I think this is where we're going to have some of the challenges. Indeed. And we'll probably talk a little more about AI before we wrap. And I also have a surprise question for you. But oh. before we go there, uh, before the conference on your uh, wumbling blog, your long running blog, I should say, you did an expectations post on the conference and though we're only through one day, I'm really curious, you went out on a limb, yeah, and said there would be a lot of AI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that was good, the gutsy call on your part. But, but you, you had a bunch of um, things you wanted to take a look at and get answers about uh, everything from opportunity marketplace to recruitment to talent intelligence hub. Uh, give me a status report after day one. What have you learned? So, um, pretty impressed with actually the pace of innovation that's happening. So, um, you know, comparative to previous years, it does seem that there's quite going to be quite a lot in this coming release mm. you know, in, in these um, different areas. Talent Intelligence Hub, I love for the fact that it is actually not going to cost customers additional. They will be able to adopt this with the growth portfolio um, and, and start using that. Look, it's going to be a huge piece of effort for organizations to figure out what their skills are. You know, that even if SAP is going to provide a, a library and ontology, of you know possibly thirty thousand different skills that they can choose from. My goodness, can you imagine trying to choose what the skills of our of your mm. organisation? That's always been hard. So I think that's actually going to be a challenge for people to adopt. Um, did I see much more that I was wanting to see on that? Yeah, look, I, I'm I'm happy with what I've seen. I'm happy with where it's going. I think that there's a lot of things that are still there, which are speaking to the product managers, we seem to align. Like I was mm. talking, there's, there's things that need to be stored at a person level. There's 
details and information that has to be at a person level. Um, that it currently, for most customers, is actually being stored in the employment level. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think with the changing workforce and the way the and the, the need to bring talent into your organization wherever you find it, and if that means that it's actually the talent is someone who is already in your organization doing another role, and you need to bring them elsewhere, so the concurrent employment piece. Um, this, this concept of person level versus employment level information is going to become more and more important. Mm. And it's good to see that that is being supported. It's not there yet um, in the tooling, but the concepts, the ideas there to bring things like education information, um, certificates, um, licenses in, into the Talent Intelligence Hub as a person level instead of you know, where currently they sit, which isn't. So, um, yeah, some, some cool things that are going to happen, like the product as it is, I would adopt. Right now, I'd bring my customers on that journey. Um, but I think the roadmap that's been laid out is pretty, is pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, any, uh, any other learnings from, from, from day one? Sessions, conversations, uh, bar, bar fights, bar debate. Yeah, look a little bit concerned still about. Um, so, one of the things that I've said to SOP repeatedly um, for a while now is that integrations need to be event driven. So, if something happens in your HRS, it should be, it should raise an event, which can then send out to. A third-party system that something's happened, mm -hmm. you know, and perhaps it's an access management system. Whatever, it it needs to happen, you know, almost real time, you know, from an event-based framework. Um, and it seems SAP has agreed, and they're going to use the BTP um, event mesh functionality and in integration suite to enable some of that functionality. That was in a, one of the roadmap sessions, obviously, that was prefaced with a, you know, this is planned, not a promise. Um, but when I asked about how that's going to happen from a subscription basis, I got a little scary answer that customers might actually need to pay for that um, integration suite license. And I was like, wow, that's, that's just not right. I mean, they did say that may change, but the answer was right now, you're going to have to do that. And that was going to be available coming pretty soon. Um, other things that I learned, uh, that there's, there is, there's this is a big thing that's actually going to happen to success factors in all of SAP, uh, especially all the cloud products um, in the next six months to year is that Google is um, deprecated third-party cookies and is going to deprecate third-party cookies in the Chromium line, mm -hmm. which most browsers are running off nowadays. Right. And what that means is that embedded frames in pages that are running from different domains won't work. The, the single sign-on won't work. Mm -hmm. So there's some changes. All the success factors instances are going to have their URLs changed so that they're running on a single domain. And people did not know about this. And there is still, it, it's like, this is gonna happen soon. <laughs> I'm surprised that there wasn't a little bit more uh, information about that. Well, I think that's one of the reasons to come together like this is to get that list of unresolved issues and Oh yeah, and like that's, it, that's, it's know. why you've gotta have community. Yeah. I was at a, um, an SAUG, that's the SAP Australia user group um, session, running a presentation uh, a couple of months back. And one of the things that we flagged out was that SAP are doing this thing where they are um, sealing the integration between the learning environments and the EC, uh, the, the mm. platform, so that they can do better integration. And that 
it's needed for a lot of the stuff that's being built right now, yeah? Mm. You want to have a tight integration between those mm. two platforms. Thank you for not saying seamless, by the way. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, God, that, that, word is, that word is banned from my podcast, so I appreciate you yeah, not I, using it. The, I wouldn't have. Thank you. Um, and... Um, so the, the, they're going to put the, the tight integration that is going to enable some some good stuff to happen. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that most customers actually have less learning environments in their environment than they have platform environments. So they have mm -hmm. a production and production, but then they potentially only have one non-production learning environment, whereas they would have two platform environments. I see. And whichever one you are actually tied to was going to get stuck. So if you had configured into your QA environment, because when you went live, that was the last time you actually used it, because you did your UAT in your QA mm -hmm. environment, and then you moved to. And so you left it connected there, and it wasn't connected to your preview environment. You're going to have that stuck and not be able to move it again, unless mm -hmm. you responded to an email that SAP had sent. Um, and People, like, we get these emails, like, every other week, um, support things. So I was letting people know, hey, you want to check your emails? We had, like, a couple of people in the audience went, yeah, I got that email. I never noticed. Mm. Chat, I got a week to do something. So I think it is very important to have that, as you say, community engagement. Indeed. And with that, we need to take a pause and get the door shut. Love this background noise. <laughs> One Lily? 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 Lily, have you been standing in front of that drum machine too long? Gotta roll with, roll <laughs> with the punches here in podcast land. We, we have a relatively quiet space thanks to the gracious SAP uh, media analyst program, but it's not without its glitches. Okay. So I guess we should talk briefly about AI because I don't want to totally overlook that. SAP, uh, for those who wonder, I've already written about SuccessFactor's AI philosophy back a few months mm -hmm. ago, um, but there have been fresh announcements, obviously, because you can't have a show without a bunch of AI announcements. That's just how it goes in the enterprise. Uh, SAP, SAP talked about uh, spanning the entire SAP SuccessFactor's human experience management suite to guide every people decision, which, of course, includes the um, the dual natural language generative AI co-pilot. By the way, I don't care for the term co-pilot when it comes to AI. I'm not picking on an SAP here. <laughs> no, a lot of people. You're, you're clearly picking on Microsoft. A, yeah, <laughs> e exactly. Um, I think co-pilot and co-pilot. The way the term is used implies that that can actually fly the plane. That's what a co-pilot can do. Um, yeah, that's not, not what AI not can the do. Case. So I object to that a little bit. But you know, life goes on. Uh, <laughs> SAP also mentioned the Talent Intelligence Hub, which you've touched on, um, and and of course we have these things around job recommendations and and just yeah. technically speaking the pace of delivery is going to pick up because with the pending November release, there's going to be 40 generative AI features included and then more in May. So pretty soon we're going to hear customer reactions. So that's really what I'm curious about the most from you is, is, is this going to help you in your practice and is this going to make a difference for customers? Do we know enough about this yet or do we, are we still in wait and see mode? I, I think we're still in wait and see mode. Okay. But honestly, um, what is interesting is that many different partners for the AI. So it's not just one, it's not just like Google Bard, it's not mm. just ChatGPT, it is many different partners providing that experience. Mm -hmm. But I think what we need to understand is the um, how that's going to work from a, a licensing cost model. Right. And that's not clear yet. Yeah. Right. And, and until that becomes clear, right. that's going to then affect, okay, well, where's the ROI? Right. And, and, and that's what the customers are going to ask about. I mean, you might sure. get one or two customers who are like, no, we're absolutely all in for AI, but I don't think so. Yeah, and I think what's interesting about that is that, as you know, first of all, we're going to hear more on pricing shortly, I'm sure, um, when it comes to success factors stuff. and. You know, I hope SAP errs on the side of delighting existing customers for the most part in these early days where we have to kind of prove yep. it out because there's enough AI adoption barriers as it is. 
Um, but you know, that's really SAP's call. It's just that I hope vendors like SAP are aware that when they uh, insert pricing, aggressive pricing into the discussion, they open up the options for customers to say, hey, I'm gonna look at a lot of third-party solutions as well. Well, uh, the, so, I, I think that this is gonna be an interesting thing. Yeah. I was talking um, about, is there a potential for AI lock-in as well? Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, we, we, training all these models up with your company's information right. and you know how your company works so that you can make the model work better. I mean, how are you going to bring that training with you if you decide to go somewhere else right. as well? Yeah. So, yeah, um, so there's a certain, there's like a kind of a model debt type of thing. It's a new form of tech debt potentially if you fine tune a model enough, then it does. Because I don't yeah. think you're gonna, I, I, know, yeah. I was speaking to Holger, he has a different opinion, but I think yeah. I think he's possibly living in a little bit of a idealistic land as to how that's going to work. I, I think we're gonna be abstracted from those models and where they are and, and who they're with. And it's just going to be, okay, you've got functionality. And I think that's what people want. They don't, you know, when you're buying SaaS, you don't right. necessarily want to know that there's a HANA underneath or it's a chat yeah. GPT that's providing the functionality. You just want it to work, yeah? And it works fast enough and well right. enough for you to do the stuff. And then you pay a reasonable price for it. And, yeah. that's, and that's what you want to be able to do. Um, but I think that that is gonna then lead to this, you know, well, how, how do we get out of that, and, and, and as right. you said, the pricing is going to be interesting because why would a you know an organization which is running Microsoft right. not just go full in with Copilot and right. then try to expose yes S, their SAP data if you're not careful in, in, into yeah, there exactly if you're not careful if you're a vendor you become a data repository for some other vendor's AI that's solution right. absolutely and that's what you have to be really careful about in this pricing thing and uh, you know we'll see if SAP can get that right because at the same time we do acknowledge these systems are incredibly expensive to run and that's so right. there are pricing consequences but it, it, I, I think it can't be for free <laughs> but the other really interesting thing to watch well there's two things I wanted to mention off your example one is I've done a fair amount of research on this fine-tuning the model issue and one interesting thing is that it's a little bit different than customizing an ERP system in the sense that that um, you can still update your base model even if you even if you fine train it which is pretty cool it's not every vendor can do this but yeah. a lot of the t a lot of the vendors i've talked to can do this which is really different than like erp where if you customize your erp you couldn't swap out the base That's system right. in in ai scenarios you actually can which is kind of interesting because it implies you might be able to stay a little more current and still customize which is fascinating but uh, on a separate point just in terms of like looking at like how things are going to go with with pricing i think one other fascinating component is that there are these out-of-the-box use cases that are obviously going to increase productivity yep. to some extent, like job descriptions. Yep. You know, you can find most people don't want to write job descriptions. If this can produce an accurate job description, people are going to be psyched. Yeah. But but a lot of the most interesting HR and talent scenarios, I think, are going to be industry-specific and company-specific, and they're they're going to require some co-innovation. And what we're seeing is that customers, when they try these tools, have all these new ideas of how they could use this for different stuff. And they're asking the vendor, hey, can we do this? Can we do that? These are co-innovation scenarios. These are not scenarios where I think you're going to be able to make a lot of money in the early going. Yeah. Now, as you package it and refine it, I think that's a whole different story. But anyway, I, th I think it's a fascinating journey, and I'm hoping that vendors like SAP will be flexible and say, we're going to evolve with customers on this and we're not going to worry as much about aggressive pricing as we are on adoption. But again, they're playing a game with the public markets too. And That's so right. this is the dance that vendors yep. go through. So, so. so as, to go back to your initial question, I think it's too early. Yep. Uh, too early to say yep. where it's at. Thank you for bringing us back. Yep. I, I, think, I think that, yeah, when we know where that's going to be, I've seen some amazing things. I didn't think I was going to smile quite so much as I did when I saw some of those things. Yeah. That, that blew me away. It's like, yeah, I should have known that it was possible to do some of these things, but it was impressive nevertheless. Yep. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's see. I hope that I get the opportunity to implement these at some of my customers. I really do. Yeah, and we should wrap soon because we, we've incorporated more background noise, and I'm conscious of that for the listeners. Um, but I do want to, since you did bring us back, which was really helpful, thank you for doing that, 
just in terms of your firm, you say, okay, let's see what the customers think. How is your firm approaching AI and success factors? Is it the kind of thing where, where we, are, we are just heavily invested or how's that gonna go? Look, um, AI is, is, it's new for everyone, I think. Yeah. Um, we have, we've, I personally, within our own firm, I've had instances where I've had to tell people to stop using AIs because of privacy concerns yeah. about the usage. And in other cases, it's like, well, why aren't we using the AI mm. to, to solve this? But um, certainly when it comes to pushing products to customers, I think it's still going to be a little bit of a novelty. Like, we're still mm. moving people from 25-year-old payroll solutions, you know, or even older, yeah, on onto SAP solution to try and make their life easier and, and reduce the amount of maintenance work, the, you know, mm -hmm. and the technical debts that they've got. So, I don't think that's a huge concern for right. many of the customers. But with the amount of noise that's happening in the past year about AI, you can be damn sure it's going to be on a couple of those yeah. RFQs that are coming yeah. in. Is what it does. What AI yeah. does your solution do, and how does it manage it, and yeah. and so on? So, yeah, it will come in, but I don't think it is going to be quite the avalanche. Certainly, in in the medium, smaller yeah. end of town, yeah, which is where I do a lot of my work. Well, and there's the other through. thing too, right? Which is, uh, if you want to get a little bit visionary here, help you know, tell the AI prompt, help me to migrate this customer from blah 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 release of SAP to success factors and configure them for retail or whatever. <laughs> right? I mean, you, I mean, granted, I mean, granted, you, you granted, could. granted, it's not going to work. No, yet, it's John. not. No, it's it's <laughs> not going to work. But to your point, it would be really interesting to see what kind of implementation plan would get spit out. And you know, obviously, this wouldn't be something you would automate at this point. But it would super in be interesting to be able to, if you could do that, for example, from a repository of all the projects that you've done before, and it just simply pulls a project summary and pulls. Look, blah, blah, I, I, blah, I think you know? there is going to be some amazing yeah. use cases that are going to happen in the. You know the implementation space, right? Make things quicker and faster. Yeah, but potentially, uh, you know, this. You know, I spoke to someone who talked about the possibility of an AI asking questions to a customer, which would then auto-populate a workbook, which would then auto-populate the configuration right. of the solution, and that's fantastic. I mean, that would yeah. take down your implementation time by a huge. But I know from experience that it's yeah. not the problem about populating the workbook with the questions from right. the customer. It's about going back to the customer and going, are you sure you really want to do the thing that you've been doing for the last 25 years again right. in your new system? Well, and now you've come full circle to the proper role of a partner because the proper role of a partner is challenging the customer at times and saying, actually, there's a better way of doing things, and here's why. It's not just, oh, we're gonna implement this scenario for you, right? Yeah. And so as a result of that, you, you couldn't take something that was just output from a machine and say that's gonna work for every customer would, in every situation. It, <laughs> you I mean, couldn't look, do I it. Think, I think we may see some really low-cost implementations yeah. go that way, but if you want a quality implementation that's gonna actually provide you, the, that's where you have consultants who have worked in the industry for X number of years and, and understand where the solution is and also where your industry is going. And I yeah. think that's, that's the, right. the, the, the correct way to do things. Um, but if the tooling can help enable someone like that to, to provide more value and, and waste less time on the admin, Then that's then, gonna be great. Yeah. That, and, that, and I think that's where you know, partners like ourselves, uh, implementation partners are gonna have to figure out you know, where, where can we use it? And right. try and you know reduce the cost to the customer yep. to get a, a better solution, but still keep that quality gate, which I think is the human in interaction piece, to, and you know, the ability to talk back and say, "Hey, think about this." No, I, I think actually that you should be paying tax on that. You better check. You know. Yeah, <laughs> and you really you raise a really important point, which is there's going to be a level of disinformation from bottom feeding service providers that try to use this to to present the concept of a heavily discounted 
you know, basically automated implementation. And, and to your point, like the companies to go down that road are going to be in a lot of trouble. And that's not incredibly different from the massively outsourced projects that we've seen in the past sometimes, it's but it's just more like that on steroids. It will be, yes. And, and, it, and it's going to create an important challenge in the public domain to try to educate customers around, like, if you're going to go that route, here's some significant risks along yeah. that, right? And there is a you get what you pay for thing that applies to this as well. So This is true. Anyway, fascinating times, right? <laughs> it, it is. It is interesting. Yeah. Well, so I guess we can we commit you to a post-event blog post to answer yes, the questions? Yes, I will. I will absolutely okay. follow up and say you okay. know, where I got to and, okay. and, and the answers. Yeah. You're stuck now. I'll put the link in the description so people can check because... Now you're forced to write it, so you're completely, <laughs> Thanks, John. You're completely screwed. <laughs> so, hey, it's your fault. I, mean, I, you, I agree to it, yeah. You pretty much exactly promised it. in the blog, too. I, I so. did as well. You know. Yeah, but, uh, but good luck chasing down the rest of your questions, and it's great to catch up. Thanks, Chris. That's great, John. Thank Take you. care.